Well, hi, everybody. Welcome to the virtual red bench for any new faces in the audience tonight. And I can see there are quite a few. Um, I am Abby, the director here at the Vermont Ski and Snowboard Museum. Uh, this series has been virtual for over a year now. So I thought I would revisit why this is called the red bench speaker series, especially since many of you maybe haven't been into the museum yet. The red bench is an actual bench and it is actually red. It's spent years around the fireplace at the Octagon Lodge at the top of Stowe. And now the bench sits on the main floor of the museum and continues to be a gathering point for visitors. And you can see that behind me a little bit if I point in the right direction, behind JG. Um, so when this series was in person and we would actually gather around that red bench, admission was $10. Uh, when we went virtual, we made the series complimentary. But if you are feeling generous, we encourage you to make a similar donation today. We are a nonprofit organization and funding is often a struggle. And if more viewers attending these events donated, this series could become the financial stability the museum really needs. To reward your generosity, everyone that donates at least $10 will be entered into a raffle for a pair of darn tough snow socks. The more you donate, the more entries you'll receive. And since it is the holiday se season and I am feeling extra generous, we're gonna raffle off three pairs of socks. So get your donations in tonight and I will draw those winners tomorrow. Also helping support this series are our Red Bench Series sponsors. I wanna thank our silver sponsor, RK Miles, our bronze sponsors, AJ Ski and Sports and Sisler Builders, and our media sponsor, Vermont Ski and Ride. Without their support, this series definitely would not be possible. All right, tonight we have two very special guests, Peter Radicher and JG Gern. Peter is joining us all the way from Austria, and we are extra grateful that he's staying up so late to join us tonight. It is about a little past 1 a.m. where he is. Peter grew up at the base of Okio Mountain, I hope I pronounced that right, in Austria, where he now runs the family business, uh, Archer House Radicher, which is a hotel, hostel, ski area. As soon as Peter discovered snowboarding as a child, he was hooked. In addition to running the family business, he helps organize snowboarding events, volunteers for the local mountain rescue, and is the founder of the Snowboard Museum. Uh, he has a collection of over 800 boards, and was inspired to write a book about the development of the snowboard. The book called Boards, A Brief History of the Snowboard is one of, if not the most comprehensive snowboarding books I have ever seen. Uh, I'm getting distracted by comments. <laughs> Peter will be taking us yeah. on a journey through the pages tonight. And joining Peter is mo moderating tonight's event is Vermont Ski and Snowboard Museum Hall of Fame member and Stowe's own J.G. Gernt, also joining me from the museum tonight. J.G. assisted Peter in the creation of this book, and his love for sliding on snow shaped his life. He is best known for his role in designing revolutionary surf-inspired boards like the Fish, Bololo, Nug, and Resonator. He's built boards for legendary riders like Terry A. Hawkinson, Kelly Clark, Red Gerard, Jeff Brushy. Ross Powers, and many more. JG spent his spends his winter days on snow, riding and testing a variety of boards, and is always trying to advance the snowboarding world. So this book, while currently not printed in the US, is available to purchase on Peter's website, snowboardmuseum.com. If you would like to purchase this book, you can use code REDBENCH21 at checkout, and Peter will generously donate 10% of each sale back to the museum. This book would make a great gift. Uh, if you have questions, we will be answering audience questions at the end. So type those in the Q&A box at um, the bottom of your screen, not the chat, just the Q&A. It's hard to kind of manage both. Um, so type those into the Q&A box and we'll get to as many of those questions uh, after the discussion. And I want to thank you all for being here tonight. Uh, JG, I will let you take it from here. Thank you, Abby, and thanks to everybody for joining us here tonight. Uh, as you know, I'm in the museum, and I just wanted to give you a little bit of uh, a background of how this night actually came to be. Um, a couple of years ago, Peter had contacted me to uh, get some more information for myself on boards that I have shaped and developed over the years that were going to be in the book. And so we had a communication, um, a lot of emails back and forth and storytelling. And so I got to know Peter um, a little bit over the years and his history, which he can go into a little bit more, his family history and what he does and 
um, how the book came about. Um, but he sent me a copy of the book and I was blown away. I was, uh, I couldn't believe it. I, I didn't know what to expect, but when I got the book and I started going through it, I was just, my mind was blown. Um, just when you think you know a lot about snowboarding, uh, you can get this book and you, you know, <laughs> you know very little, or I know, I knew very little. Um, so I presented the book to uh, Abby in the Vermont Ski and Snowboard Museum. And I said, hey, check this book out. This would be a great book um, that you could sell in the gift shop because um, it's anybody who's a snowboarder or a rider and just would be a really nice gift and something you can always reference to and go back to. Um, so that's kind of how this Red Bench series came about um, tonight. And, um, and I'm, I appreciate everybody joining and please donate if you can, because it is a nonprofit like Abby had mentioned. And um, the museum, we're very thankful that they are supporting snowboarding and us riders, and we're thankful for being here. Um, so with that, I wanna get, you know, have Peter talk a little bit about his history. We're gonna go through the book, not page for page, it's over 200 pages in here. And, you know, in the act, back of the book, um, he did mention that, you know, there might be mistakes in the book. There might be things missing. There's not every board ever made is in this book by any means. But the early boards, the modern snowboard, uh, split boards on the PAL surfers, it's all in this book. So be patient with that. It's not like the end all, end all, but it's a really awesome book. And I hope you like the presentation tonight and look forward to the questions near the end. Peter? Thank you very much. Thank you, Eddie, for having me here and giving me the opportunity to show the book. And thank you, JG, for hosting it. It really uh, calmed, calmed me a little because uh, if I don't know what to say anymore, I'm sure you, you know a lot of stories and I'm quite sure you do know a lot about snowboarding much more than I do. Uh, so happy to be here and thank you. So, um, what about me? Well, um, how did I start the book thing? Well, first I started collecting boards just because I liked them and I was on a, a kind of, um, by my family history, it was already clear that I would be interested in history. My grand-grandfather uh, founded the first skiing school here in uh, Salzburg, the region of Salzburg, and he was with Hannes Schneider from Alberg and everything. And my grandfather then was Olympian at, uh, at the Oslo Olympics in the 50s. And so I always was interested in skiing history. And then I, uh, as a young kid, I started ski jumping and soon switched over to snowboarding when it came to my area, more or less. And I started racing and I I really loved snowboarding from day one, so I, I really was into it. So uh, later on, um, I, I was at the Holman Kolm Ski Museum in Norway, and this, the presentation of all the ski history, skiing history was awesome. We had all the disciplines, all the skis from all over the world really perfectly. And in one corner, there were like 10 snowboards. And I said, whoa. Five of those I have in my collection and this could be done better. Then I started uh, studying sports in Innsbruck and there I got to know a lot of people and got a lot of snowboards and I started collecting. First it was online. Later I came home to my family business. Uh, as, as mentioned, we have a hotel, a hostel and a little skiing area. And here in my hostel, where, where we are at now, at the bar, um, I started putting different displays with snowboards on and got more boards, more boards, more boards. And yeah, I had so many boards and I thought I want to give something back and uh, study about those boards. And so I decided to do the book pro project. Well, how did it run with the book project? Well, um, I started with so many topics uh, um, from 
sports, bindings, boots, uh, resorts, uh, famous uh, developers, famous writers, um, inventors and stuff. And it was so big, so much to cover. And uh, as I haven't been there from the beginning, I, I focused on the things I could touch, the boards I do have here. And that's how I entered into the, uh, to the book. And um, it took me finally eight years to get it done. Yeah, it was kind of, <laughs> uh, I started with, with uh, local brands and developers and talking to them, getting to know the stories behind the boards, uh, searching people in the industry all over the world and getting in contact with JG, for example. And he was so help helpful. Uh, with other brands, it was more difficult. And, you know, who are you? Why would we help you? And stuff like that happened too. But also in those uh, group of groups of collectors on Facebook and Instagram, people were so helpful. And I want to help uh, thank everyone who helped. And in the end, uh, it was a really, really, really cool book. Um, also with the graphics and stuff. Uh, after eight years of research uh we could get it done it was really really cool so the book i'll start with a little um definition uh, coming from from sports studies i i kind of uh, started it with a de definition what i see as the modern snowboarding it's standing sideways on a single board uh for gliding on snow with hands hands free and feet attached and I tried to get all the movements and sports equipments inside that cover at least two or three of those four components. Uh, that was a little ambitious. In the end, uh, it would have been too big. So I, I got it done in 220 pages, more or less. And um, it was structured in three big steps. The pre precursors, the beginnings, and the modern snowboard. Well, yeah, uh, when we start with the precedence, I'll just have the table of contact shown. Do, do, do. I think too, Peter, it's uh, obviously there's a lot of great photos in here um, in the book, um, but even more so uh, the, the, the uh, stories um, that go along with it is like, when I was reading the book, um, the whole chapter on the 90s, as I was reading it, I, I felt like I was reliving the 90s again. Like I remembered so much and, you know, that section of the book, especially because like there was so much going on in snowboarding. There, there was like, it was just, uh, you know, the product, the riding styles, the clothing, everything, the skate influence, just like the 90s, you know, were it. And um, so there's a lot of, a lot more than the pictures in the book is what I'm trying to say, which is really cool. Thank you. Yeah, the, uh, the beginnings are a really exciting chapter and uh, I love that really, really a lot. And that was kind of the, the biggest thing to get to know because a lot of stories and people are, are not uh, telling their, their, their roots and what, how it happens, but I could find out a lot of stories and yeah. There are pictures, but there are a lot of stories and written things. But back mm -hmm. to the predecessors. I started far, far back, like in a few thousand years ago, with, with surfing, with the Knappenrössel, with the last board from Turkey, the Rittbrett, uh, the hay board, that's here in my region as well, uh, the bunker, skiing, surfing, skateboarding, monoski, and windsurfing, kind of, that were the the start of everything. So uh, let's just check the, the last board. Quite some people know already that story that back in Turkey, uh, in the 18th century, they started riding on boards like this one. The Turkish last board, just made of wood, bent up nose, and they were kind of riding it. Uh, like we snowboard and they're doing it until today. I have a picture of uh, Stefan Gimpel and Jeremy Jones trying it. 
They were down there in Turkey and it's really, really cool board to see. And we had something similar here in Austria. The Knappenross that was used when people that were working on the, in the gold mines in Rauris, uh, they had the, the boards on their back, hiking up, working all day there, uh, then putting the, the gold on the board and sliding down like on a sledge. But we found writings that say that the fast and brave ones also uh, did it in standing. So they were snowboarding in about the 16th century already, 15th, 16th century. It's really fun to, to see how many movements all over the world uh, were kind of uh, leading to our snowboard. Really, really cool. Well, uh, one of the biggest influences on our snowboard uh, without question is skiing, you know? And it's thousand years ago, so there were writings on walls uh, in China and Norway. Uh, but going to the modern times, um, skiing really influenced the, the snowboards, like the construction, edges, bases, skiing areas, and we all know about it. But the other way around, uh, snowboarding also contributed quite a lot to skiing. I'll have a little examples here. Powder ski. Georg Inschwentner from here, from Grödig, uh, about an hour from here. He was skiing and uh, it was an art to ski in deep snow. Uh, you had to really do the technique and uh, have, have a lot of, of knowledge of, of snow and everything to, to be able to do it. And he saw when snowboards came up here, how easy it was to float on, uh, on, on a snowboard. And he thought, well, we could try it with skis. So he cut out the, the first powder skis out of this atom, one of those atomic snowboards. And uh, his prototype worked. Uh, he put the bindings on, decentral a little more, so, so he wouldn't have to stand that, that open like it's done today. Uh, and he showed it to the atomic uh, responsibles and they made a prototype and had it tested with the heli skiing uh, Mike Wiegele in Canada and in the States and it worked perfectly and so the Powder Plus uh, atomic ski, the first powder ski, uh, hit the market. It took about uh, 10, 15 years, 20 years until it was kind of uh, uh, widely spread because uh, the good skiers who already knew powder skiing um, would say, why would we need a, an extra ski or something like that? We, we know it already. So it was, wasn't was seen that nice, but uh, nowadays looking at the powder skis everybody has, uh, it really made its way coming from snowboarding. The same thing in the freestyle area. Twin tip skis. You can see here the Salomon 1080, there were already twin tip skis, like there were fat skis as well, but not widely spread. Uh, here, the Salomon 1080 was the first freestyle ski, uh, twin tip ski that widely hit the market. And it was in 97 when Salomon, uh, who first just made uh, bindings and boats, later uh, made skis. Uh, and in 97, they entered the snowboard market and at a development meeting, uh, the, the snowboards uh, were seen and one of the ski developers kind of wanted to try it at the skis and it totally worked out. And nowadays in the snow parks, there are quite a lot of skiers as well uh, doing the freestyle thing. Peter, didn't, um, didn't a lot of the side cut uh, it's not, not a lot of the side, but some of the side cut um, was uh, skiers took notice of. And I remember even here in Stowe, uh, Mark Corval, I called him Psycho Mark. He had taken a snowboard um, and cut it in half to make skis. So he was using the side cut on his inside edge. And this guy would ski like nobody else on a, on a board that was cut in half because the radiuses were way different than um, what skis were, and the length was a lot shorter. But this guy would fly and make beautiful turns, 
and I think that stemmed a little bit. So it wasn't just um, the powder ski and the and the and the twin tips. It was also some of the side cuts that snowboarders were experimenting with that caught the, the eye and the attention of skiers. Totally, the carving ski uh, had a really really tough way to make it to the market, and it was um, made out of, of snowboards. Uh, mm -hmm. The first real carving ski here in Europe was the, uh, I'll share the screen a little, du, 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 we'll see, um, was the snow rider, you know, and it was cut out of a hot snowboard. You can mm -hmm. see it here in, uh, on, the, on the screen. And the guy, uh, Reinhard Fischer from Austria, um, he started it, uh, he, was, he was a ski trainer and also did uh, grass skiing. And he was inspired by Ingmar Stenmark's technique and the grass skiing technique uh, combined with snowboarders he saw uh, that just putting it on the edge would work. So he, he contacted all the Austrian skiing brands and asked them would have to make extra machinery to, to, to produce those skis as he wanted in them, like short and white. Uh, nobody did it for him. They just made long skis with, with really, really small uh, waist and it, they didn't work out as well. So he was at three or four big companies and nobody did his prototypes. So in the end, he cut it out of, his, of that snowboard and convinced a little German brand to do the carving skis. Well, they worked with his technique, but why couldn't they make it directly to the market? Well, it was just the time when the cap ski got... Uh, famous and a lot of brands like Fisher, uh, they had their skis made, but had to put a cap over, cap construction over it. To, so they were able to sell them because it was so modern to have cap skis. And all the brands had invested a lot in the machinery to do cap and they didn't want to jump onto the carving thing in the beginning. Uh, later it was quick when the first uh, races were successful, like in the States, it was Bodie Miller with the K24. Um, wow, they saw how cool it worked. And as you said, uh, it was a unique way of skiing. Uh, really, really cool. And we had another board, like the swing bow, <laughs> developed 1981 in Germany. Well, that are carving skis, totally. The platform didn't make it in the end, but the radius is everywhere now. <laughs> it, it's, it's interesting um, how, when you go through the book, obviously, you know, we're here in the US and uh, we think of, you know, that snowboarding was, you know, founded in the US and, um, but what was going on in Europe and, and at the time, and, you know, you mentioned windsurfing, like obviously, you know, the snowboarding came from, you know, skateboarding and surfing and skiing and, but the windsurfing part of it, and there's a lot of companies that uh, were windsurfing brands um, and I, my roots are in windsurfing. Um, and, but there are a lot of brands that were making windsurfers started making snowboards and this whole, uh, you know, the European brands were kind of doing their own thing and it, maybe they trickled into the US like Mistral um, and there's a, a few others, F2, um, but it's just kind of uh, we like, well, the US we had, you know, Tom Sims and, and Steve Dare from Flight and everybody, um, but the windsurfing, uh, you know, and, and, and now everybody's kiteboarding, but windsurfing, it's unique because you have to go uh, regular and goofy. So you go on one tack, you're going regular foot, and you go back on the other tack and you're going goofy foot. So it really uh, it balances out your body. Um, but it's just kind of interesting how like windsurfing was really big in Europe on the lakes and Tarifa in Spain and different places. And totally. that kind of like, shaped a lot of the snowboarding, uh, what was going on in Europe um, with snowboarding at the time. Totally. I just scared one, uh, shared a screen with the Fanatic uh, that came from windsurfing, Fanatic mm -hmm. snowboards. 
Yeah. And a lot of European shapers were influenced by the windsurfing uh, wave, like Serge Duprat um, in, or Peter Fessler from um, Huga Booga. Uh, they mm -hmm. all started with the windsurfing idea. They wanted to do it in winter and they tried things like that. Really, really big thing. We all know about uh, skateboarding totally influencing surfing, but windsurfing is often overseen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, what about you, JG? Uh, were you windsurfing or skiing as a kid? How did you come into the <laughs> winter sports? Um, well, I, as a kid, I, I mean, it's originally uh, skateboarding, surfing. Um, and yes, I did do some skiing. Um, and I kind of like, I was kind of like a mogul skier, if you would say. Um, and soon as I, I was snowboarding on snurfers a little bit, and obviously the resorts didn't allow uh, snowboarding yet. Um, but quickly, as a teenager, there was no more skiing in my life. <laughs> um, and it was all about standing sideways. And it was pretty apparent that that's the direction I was going. And that's the direction I'm still going. So, um, but it's nice, like, uh, I think now, like, I think some of the ski and snowboard tensions a little bit um, eased up a little bit, I would say. Um, and now it's really kind of like snow sports and mountain sports. And um, I know a lot of people who, I know a lot of pro skiers who actually pal surf and they're also skateboarding and surfing. So it really, you know, as long as you're out there enjoying the mountains and the snow, and being friendly to everybody, it's it's all good. It doesn't matter what, what sport you're really doing. Cool. Well, so we are already at the beginning. So uh, let's check the table of contents. Give me a second to show it. Da, da, da. Here we go. If I find it. <laughs> Here we go. Well, you already mentioned the snurfer, but there were so many different snurfer boards. White bear snooky, yeah. the ski bomb, the skiffer, the skimmer. And then we come to the, to the really big beginnings like winter stick and Burton and Sims, but you just see the table of contents. There were so many sliding devices. And wow, we, we this one was really a big part and you said you 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 remembered the stories and the beginnings and it's really really uh, uh emotional part the beginnings were were, were big times uh, so we always have to talk about the snurfer it's really a it was a great board sherman poppen in 65 uh was set to to fix together two skis for his daughters to play in the snow at Lake Michigan. Oh yes, there were kind of different models and uh, about a million pieces sold. Yeah. These are the boards that I first started on uh, when I was like 11 years old. Um, and I can remember, uh, I think they were 15 or $20, um, but there was only one store that sold them and I remember my dad take me because I'd break them. I'd jump off these rock walls and I'd break them in half. There was no fiberglass in them. Um, and so I'd go through boards pretty quickly. And it wasn't long that I, it took me to figure out I needed to ha you know, have my feet attached to the board somehow. Um, and my dad actually came up with, and there's things in the book about it, like people using inner tube tires, um, it, the inner tube part, to make straps to hold your feet on. And that's exactly what my dad did for me. Um, awesome. And it made a world of difference. Um, we weren't necessarily making a lot of turns back then on these. We were bombing hills and going straight and trying to jump off anything that we could. But uh, this is kind of like in the US is what a lot of people started on um, and a lot of people knew. And I actually uh, had a chance to, uh, I met Sherman Poppin oh. and, um, and sure enough, like he also rode one of my fish boards with Jake up in Alaska and sent me a note on how it rode, um, which is really, really cool. So, um, but I know in Europe and other places, there was a lot of other people experimenting around the same time. 
So we can't say that Sherman was Sherman was the beginning of it, um, but it's in the states that's what most people know. Yeah, and uh, they are totally right as well. He influenced a lot of people, like uh, Jake Burton, and a lot of people gave him credit, and, and uh, it was because it was really widely spread and, and started the movement. There was another mm -hmm. board, the Coleco board. Uh, mm -hmm. from the early 70s that was already made out of plastic and uh, Bob Klein told me he started with one, on one of those or uh, the new founders also started on the Coleco so uh, the this is already a little wider than the Snurfer and it was made of plastic so uh, there were different uh, boards kind of all over the world yeah mm -hmm. A lot of a lot of surfboard uh, brands were also getting in on it, and I remember years ago when I was at the Colorado um, Museum, Sports Museum, and I saw so many boards in there that I've never seen in my life, um, and a lot of them were surf, you know, underground surfboard shapers making boards, and um, it was just really cool to see because I think that was all happening on the West Coast. And I never saw them on the, in New England, um, so I never didn't know anything about them. Um, but it was just a good example of like going into a museum and seeing things like you'd never seen before. Um, but it was also one thing I wanted to mention too, is like, um, if you think about the kind of the founding fathers of snowboarding in the US, um, Jake and Tom, Chuck Barfoot, Dimitri, Molovich and um, Steve Dare from Flight, these often overlooked. Um, but one unique thing about those five guys, and I'm sure there were some others, um, but they were all from the East Coast and all from New Jersey, uh, New York, up through New England, Rhode Island, um, and they were all surfers. And so I think that kind of really, and they wanted to surf the snow in the wintertime. So I think that kind of, shaped a lot of things and obviously there's the surfers on the west coast kind of doing the same thing but they the paths never really crossed so i think the and, and then in the midwest as well wherever there was snow um you know people had ideas how to how to take how to utilize the, the winter and the snow yeah well talking about the pioneers uh here we have kind of a little selection of late 70s uh the Sims, Flying Yellow Banana, the Burton BB-1, this is a replica, and the Winter Stick, and you see uh, um, kind of the surf snurfer influence here with the water ski bindings on it, still the leash on the nose, the skateboard influence uh, with the skate deck mounted on a, on a Weber ski board from, from the early Sims boards, and Dimitri Milovic, already doing uh, big snowboards with, with shape, uh, 3D base, uh, funny binding, strap thing, uh, really the beginnings uh, from a lot of pioneers. I'm sure there were a lot of other pioneers like Chuck Barfoot or uh, checking to Japan, like the Moss Snow Sticks also were great boards uh, from really, really early beginnings in the 70s. And this one is from about early 80s and also 3D shape, fiberglass, hardwood bindings. There were a lot of things going on all over the world. But yeah, in the US, uh, they really got it started. Really, really awesome. It's, it's interesting. Uh... You know, as I mentioned, like Europe had some things going on in the U.S., but the influence of, of the J Japan snowboarding culture and boards like Moss, who still making boards now. Um, and you did mention a little bit, Peter, about like 3D boards and 3D bases. And um, who was it? It was uh, Bill Stewart did a board in early 80s or something, a 3D board. Um, and even before that, people were experimenting with 3D bottoms. And now in snowboarding, um, it's, you know, kind of through pal surfing, the 3D is just coming around now, 30 or 40 years later after these guys were doing it. Um, so it's kind of interesting that it went through that a whole many, many years of flat bottom boards. And now it's coming around to 
you know, hey, maybe maybe flat, flat's not the answer. So, yeah, and it's uh, like you said, it was there already a long time ago. Uh, mm -hmm. This is a tribute to the steward board from I don't know eighty one or something. He did mm -hmm. a kind of he was a surfboard shaper and did three three D base and battalion. Uh, started in about 2005, 2006 with their triple base, uh, a 3D base mm -hmm. as well. And getting to know his story, they made a tribute board for him, like the Camoto Italian yeah. Stewart, really funny shape, funny mm -hmm. board. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we are already kind of entering into the modern era, you know. Uh, as but you said, there were quite, uh, we were talking about the US, but there were in the early 80s, a lot of European things like uh, the Smurfer, uh, the, the Swingo we saw, or <laughs> for example, the Rollet Snow Skate, a French uh, skateboard for snow. Uh, yeah. And dude, this thing works today as well. I, I tried it a few times and it's really funny, really an awesome deck. I yeah. like it. Oh, it's, it's, it's interesting too, shapes. all the different names of uh, some of the brands as you go through the book. Um, there was some, you know, the Great White, uh, and there was just uh, the DNA, oh, or DNA yeah. and just, you uh, know, uh, you know, funky snowboards, like there's uh, so many like really cool names. And um, as we're going into more into the modern snowboard, but like back in the 90s, a lot of people don't realize there was hundreds and hundreds of snowboard brands. You know, there was like three, four, 500 brands, 30 different publications. And it was just amazing um, how much was going on then compared to how many brands there are now. Mm -hmm. Well, and when it, the snowboarding wave hit Europe, um, people like Eric Gros from Hawaii Surf, the sh uh, a shop in Paris, uh, he started to do his own thing because he couldn't get enough boards. And mm -hmm. as he, he wasn't too experienced in the beginning, he also brought out blank plans, a thing that's coming back again with, from Yes and other brands. Uh, he had it mid 80s. <laughs> and yeah. he. Yeah. You see here, it has a base and you cut out your shape as you like it. He also did mm -hmm. uh, asymmetrical shapes really early. Funny guy. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. I could meet him this summer in Paris. Really great stories. Yeah. Another French brand that was really innovative, more or less, DEA. Um, yeah, DEA. Yeah. We had a kind of fish shape, mid 80s, Swallowtail, and uh, Regis Rollins with his Apocalypse Surf, also from France. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of influence, a lot of neon style, great times. <laughs> it's amazing how many, uh, when you go through the book or just seeing some of the uh, boards that Peter's showing here, <clears throat> how many uh, fish type shapes there were, um, you know, and then that was kind of like 80s, early 80s. And then they just completely went away to twin tips and long boards and everything else. Um, and then it kind of took a minute to come bring that fish shape back, um, which we'll talk about a little bit later. But back there, they were there and then they disappeared, you know, um, kind of interesting how that happens. Totally. Yeah, uh, and getting a little back to the skiing history, when you look at the skis, they were the same from the 20s to the 90s, uh, long and small. And mm -hmm. then with the carving ski, with snowboarding, they, 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 they started the variety of shapes. And snowboarding mm -hmm. kind of, um, between racing and freestyle, the race boards kind of from the asymmetrical to the symmetrical, um, Freestyle to short and twin tip. Um, about in the 90s, the time there were times they were kind of always looking like the same, but uh, not like in skiing. There were always some people trying different things and uh, swallowtails, fish shapes, and so on. 
Uh, mm -hmm. So we totally enter the, the modern times and I'll just show uh, the table of contents do, 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 from the book. And as JG said, um, there are not all boards in the world inside there. Uh, I just choose boards that seem important to me and that I had here in the museum. So I could touch them, I could uh, write them, I could try them, and so I could tell something about them. And all the stories I got to know uh, from a lot of people all over the world are really interesting. And here you can see what's in there from the first pro model, uh, Sims Terry Kidwell Pro, uh, down to modern boards like a Gentem Stick from, from this season. Uh, just have a look. I described the different brands, where they came from, uh, the different boards, how they look like, and stories behind them, if I could find them. So modern snowboarding, huge topic. Uh, let's just get some of those boards and maybe have JG tell us something about them. What would you say about the, the first fish or? Well, the, I don't, yeah, I don't, I don't know if that's, I mean, it is kind of a, it's in a modern range, but <laughs> the theory came from, from before that. Um, but yeah, the fish, it was, uh, it was interesting because a lot of boards were twin tips and everybody felt like, to ride powder, you needed a really long board. Um, and what would happen on a long board is a lot of times the nose wasn't up and you'd have to have all your weight on your back foot. Um, so back in uh, 2000 area of time, um, I was surfing quite a bit and I was developing boards with Terry for, for himself. And he was surfing more than I was. and we always talked about like float and speed and maneuverability and not having all your weight on your back foot and riding a shorter board and, you know, coming out of your turn as fast as you went into your turn and more of a surfy feel. Um, and so I feel like we, we, we accomplished what we set out to do with the fish. And right away, Terry and I are like, I think we're onto something here, but it was so, the shape of the board was just so different than what was going on at the time. Um, and now, you know, 20 plus years later, um, <laughs> a lot of boards have taper. A lot of boards look like that. Maybe they have a swallowtail, maybe they don't. Um, but I think like we kind of set the trend a little bit, not the trend because it's a performance thing. Um, you could keep equal amount of weight on both your feet and still ride deep pow on a short board. And that's what we set out to do, to ride a board that was a lot shorter than what we, like, we normally do. Um, and so, you know, I feel like maybe, you know, that's just kind of what the industry needed a little bit. And um, now we look at pretty much any, every brand has some type of board with some taper geared towards powder. And similar to surfing, like if you're in the surfing, um, you definitely have more than one board. And so that whole quiver mentality, because you need different boards for different wave heights and different breaks and whatnot. And so you'd usually have a couple different boards, you know, and the fish might be in your surf quiver. Um, so if you're in the snowboarding, it's, you know, these boards last a long time. You know, you can go back, I can go back and ride my original fish and still works great. Um, totally. so, you know, if you're collecting boards or if you just want to ride different boards, you know, getting your hands on some boards and building your own little quiver and your own little personal museum of boards is, uh, it's a really fun and cool thing to do and they'll last forever and you can hand them down to your kids and they can hand them down to their kids. Awesome. Well, uh, what else should we talk about? Mm. We had a lot of pro models well, and talking I was about say, the print. Hmm? We were talking about before a little bit um, about Alpine, oh, you know, yeah. and um, how back there was a time when some people thought Alpine was the future of the sport because we were kind of following skiing and, you know, racing around gates. And even in the first Olympics in Nagano in 98, I was there at that Olympics as a tuner for Burton riders and it didn't matter what country they were from 
and it was because no one really kind of knew. Um, but you know, Dieter Hopp and Martin Phenonymous from Austria and JCJ Anderson, I mean, the Alpine crew, those guys were awesome. Um, and the amount of you know that we were putting into the RD for Alpine boards, but uh, the whole hard boot thing, it was very ski and very going around GS gates or slalom gates, and it was very ski oriented where the other part of the sport was completely freestyle and you know jibbing and uh doing you know skate style tricks or, um and so it was like two different sports <laughs> but it was both called snowboarding and you kind of look where it happened to alpine now it's uh it's not really it's not an olympic sport anymore and um and it's kind of faded away from, I mean, I'm sure there's still people doing it, so which is awesome. Um, but it's as, as far as like the industry and, you know, producing product and selling product and getting it into the market, it's a very, very small uh, segment of the sport right now. Totally. Uh, I was racing a lot. I did the GS thing and later Parallel. Mm -hmm. And then later I switched to, to border cross and to the soft boots. But uh, I remember that um, it was really kind of big, especially in Europe. Uh, a lot mm -hmm. of races came from Europe and talking about the Olympics, like Martin Franademetz um, coming from the ISF, entering the, the fifth team there and uh, being thrown out of the Austrian team because he had a party after, after the race and stuff like that it was kind of, oh uh, yeah, the bad snowboarders. And, uh in reality the, the the races seem to be more uh calm like uh the freestyle thing kind of really got big and and took over and mm -hmm. uh, but uh what i heard um some brands like city Ravnum they still sell quite a lot of of alpine boards also to, to japan and stuff the carving mm -hmm. trend coming back Mm -hmm. um, looking forward to to calf this winter as well. Some some rides mm -hmm. are gonna mm -hmm. take it. Mm -hmm. Well, it's amazing how like even uh, all mountain boards um, or you know with a little bit of taper or no taper, how well they actually carve on trails. Um, so you're getting you can get one board now that does a lot of different things, and it's not so uh, a specialty board. You know, like um, so it's kind of we learned a lot through the years of how to design and develop a board that can be very versatile to the consumer and the person who's riding it. So I did a little bit of an Alpine. I used to ride a little bit of Alpine and I think, yeah, it was, it was in New Zealand when I first blew my ACL was on hard boots, believe it or not. And I think that kind of like got me, I was like, no more hard boots. I just, you know, like done. Um, but it was it was part of part of snowboarding you know back then you you kind of did it all you know you went like totally. moguls used to be in the u.s open and in the in the world championships used to be mogul riding and you used to have downhill straight down like you didn't even make any turns um so you kind of had to do it all and uh and that's that's kind of the sign even nowadays of like all around snowboarder right so you can ride powder you can ride park jumps you can do rails you can go out and do whatever um well-rounded it's kind of cool to see totally yeah and also the, the the soft boots with a good binding give you total control like uh you, mm -hmm. for an for an average day you wouldn't even need to have the hard boots thing it's yeah. really versatile now with different mm -hmm. boards and stuff uh, mm -hmm. Let's talk about your uh, your nug. Hmm? Yeah, the nug. Um, there's probably some nug fans out there, um, but this is another board that I developed, um, and this is here. Um, this definitely came about from me. Uh, I was skateboarding a lot more, and um, we're kind of like there's not. A, you know, a lot of new ideas don't come around that often on, um, and prove themselves out. And I really wanted to ride a shorter board um, 
that was, I didn't want to have to change my riding style. I didn't want to have, you know, different boots or bindings or to change my style. I just wanted to ride a, a shorter board that was playful, that rode snow and the new snow really well. Um, and I wanted it to be a twin tip, but I also wanted it to be a directional board. So I, we came out with um, both. And what it did, it kind of opened eyes to a lot of riders where, that they could actually ride a board that was a lot shorter than they thought they could ride. Um, so a lot of people were riding like 46s and 48s, uh, 146s, 148s, 144s, um, who their normal boards would have been 156s or 158s for something. So you're downsizing quite a bit, it makes the board lighter, it can spin easier, it can jib easier. Um, right. But it's still, it's awesome when you go fast. I, I love yeah. that. Really, it was yeah, kind stable, of opening um, my mind. And it's kind of like one of those things too. It's like now a lot of brands have boards that you downsize and they might call it different things, but like you can ride a board that's shorter than you normally ride. I mean, I used to ride uh, 163 as my everyday board and now I'm riding a 146. So it just kind of shows you over time. Um, there's a good example of riding a shorter board. The K2, the split, the, uh, the yeah, the beam, right? Yeah. yeah, the volume shift trend. Uh, now you can see it, all brands have short white boards, uh, totally yeah. playful, totally fun. Uh, yeah. Also triggered by the knock, I would say. Yeah, I think so too. It's nice to know that I uh, had some influence on, uh, on, oh, some, yes. on from powder to short boards, kind of like cover a little bit of everything and some other ones in between there for sure. So. Totally, totally. Well, uh, what other yeah, what other what other modern boards do you have um, there, Peter? That people might not have might not know, might not have seen. Well, uh, we have a lot in the book. There are kind of oof. yeah, a lot of Austrian European brands like the Convoy. Uh, Ben Dittemann did those uh, who, who is into power surfing a lot. We could uh, see some power surf boards or uh, Amplit, Peter Bauer's brand had Amplit, a lot of yeah. boards. Yeah. Uh, Corua shapes going big. Mm -hmm. The ride Alter Ego with the, the kind of split tail. A lot of different boards with funny shapes. Uh, the Dupra, like from Serge Dupra and his hot brand coming back. Uh, yeah. What's, what's what's interesting, different say, you know, what's interesting too is um, when you go through the book, like how uh, there was a time when pro models were really big. Um, and, you know, it's kind of now they're, it's not, uh, it's not as, you know, wide That's known to have a pro model. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, talking about pro models. I'm quite sure you can yeah. tell something about Terry's first pro model, or when we mm -hmm. see here the Nitro of Seth Brothers uh, pro model. Yeah, really awesome. funny stuff. They were kind of iconic boards for iconic riders. Yeah, you know, I you know, it's like it was like a a time when you, when you got a pro model, you like made it to like you made it in in you know in your riding career or whatever, and. Um, and now it's like now I don't know why, but um, they kind of definitely faded away. And it's not wasn't awesome. It wasn't cool to have a pro model, or I don't know. I think it would be cool to have a pro model. <laughs> I kind of did have some pro models, but they weren't pro models. Well, I'm working on a little project, but it's not going to be a pro model. It's not going to be a no pro model because I'm not pro. But uh, it's kind of a funny thing to to work on. Yeah. <laughs> Well, talk about funny things. What about power surfing? So yeah, it's, that, it's, that's an interesting one. How, um, you know, that kind of like, that's where it all started really, no matter where it was. And now it's over the years, it's come around and um, what, you know, it's, uh, it's something I've always done and never stopped doing it. Um, and actually, as power surfing today, 
Um, and it's, it's something that it's, uh, you know, you don't have to necessarily go to a resort, you know, and you don't have to, um, you just find anywhere you, there's a hill and some snow and, you know, you have to treat it a little bit like surfing, you know, it's like if you're surfing and you're on a wave, you know, drop in, you go down the wave and make some turns and off the top and out and like 15 second, 20 second ride, you're pretty psyched, you know, um, obviously totally. you can get a longer ride, you want to do that, but um, I think it teaches, it teaches people how to ride powder. Um, I, I felt like a lot of the younger kids, my son and his friends, um, a lot of kids' snowboards aren't really meant for powder and they're twins and the kids were always burying their nose and the flexes are wrong or whatever. But pal surfing, when the nose is up, the kids can get the feel of riding powder and gliding and the speed. And then when they're on the snowboard, then they know what that feeling was from the pal surfing. Um, so I think, you know, pal surfing is definitely for everybody and totally. it shouldn't be overlooked. And there's a lot of different boards on the market. And it kind of reminds me of surfing a little bit where you could actually make one and you're at home. Um, or, you know, there's a lot of guys around the world now that are making them and it is kind of surfy because it's like, you don't need a big press. You don't need all this fancy stuff. You don't need inserts. Um, and there's definitely some guys that are pushing it and different brands that are pushing it. And I just think it's the coolest. So I love it. Uh, it mm -hmm. For me, it was on learning to snowboard again. I was kind of mm -hmm. falling like I haven't been falling down for 20 years. Yeah. But it's so much fun. And people like Wolle from the yeah. ASMO or... Uh, here uh, the grassroots power surfers or uh, here yeah. dance convoy boards uh, yeah. in the right conditions with the right mindset after two or three turns i forget that i don't have bindings it, it just sure. Sure. takes me away and it's super sure. super fun to do if I, you have the chance just try it, please and yeah. Yeah. i saw so you were development de developing different uh boards with with surf brands and stuff and i saw your videos it's it's in inspiring it's really mm -hmm. awesome mm -hmm. it's it's interesting with the pow surfers too because um the 3d bases are, are kind of like a pretty much a norm um obviously there's a lot of boards that have flat flat bottoms which work well you know um but i i've learned a lot from pow surfing that i took to normal snowboards um so it's like okay you can still learn from the most basic thing um and what i like about, about pow surfing is there is no goofy or regular so if you're out with your buddies and you have a bunch of different boards it's so easy it's, it's kind of like surfing oh let me try your board does it there's no stance width or angles or goofy or regular you just can jump on boards you know halfway down and run oh let's switch jump on this board and um and, I and think, there we uh, go, full circle. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's cool. Like, like I mentioned before, I know a lot of, a lot of, you know, I don't know what it is, but a lot of um, skiers and a lot of pro skiers, um, it's probably because they surf ocean surf, but they they love pal surfing, and it's cool. And a lot of there's a lot of skiers who skate, you know, they're really good skateboarders. It's like wow, but they, for some reason, they, the snowboard part of it isn't in their repertoire of what they do, um, which is fine. It's more powder for awesome. me and you. <laughs> well, talking about split boards, then we kind of have a lot of, lot of, lot of things covered. Um, when you talk to people, a lot of people say, yeah, split boarding, boy Lee. Uh, invented it, but um, there were a lot of people trying different things before. Uh, some Austrian guys and Italian, um, but the first really good working, well, good working, uh, the first modern you could buy in the shop uh, was the Snow How from Uli Bettemann from Switzerland. He did it for Fnatic. And after Fnatic didn't uh, work out too well, uh, he did it with Nitro and Tommy DeLago. And this system was in the shops already 92, 93. Yeah, the, the, the section in the book on splitboarding is, is awesome. 
I mean, yeah, was really there's some really great photos, there's some really great, great stories, and, you know, a lot was going on in Europe that people in the States had no idea was going on. Um, and I, I was involved uh, with the split boards um, with Craig Kelly and Dave Downing. And um, I can remember being in Utah with Dave when he lived there and going out split boarding. And all I, all I was thinking about is I want, I want a shorter board because <laughs> they were all pretty long and it's just kind of awkward. And, um, and I eventually did the spliff, which was the really short, wide, nug uh, split board. Um, but yeah, it's just interesting how like now um, every brand, almost every brand has a split board. And there's some uh, real, some brands that they, whatever solid board they have, they have the same board in a split, which is really cool, like Cardiff. Um, but yeah, split boardings, I don't do much split boarding because I pal surf um, and I live in Vermont, but uh, I, I could see it being, if, you know, a great way to explore and, you know, spend, go on tours overnight. And, and uh, so it's, it's just interesting how, how it kind of like took off and you have certain brands that just concentrate on the binding, you know, and it's, it's really cool to see Caracorum and Spark and- um, Oh yeah, the bindings and, and the connectors are so good now. It's not yeah, like yeah. Uh, in 92, uh, it yeah. worked, but it was kind of, Right. Difficult, difficult. But nowadays, uh, the different systems, yeah, they are awesome. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, we kind of did an hour now. What about snow skates? To... Snow skates. Oh, snow yeah. Skate. Real quick. <laughs> Can't forget about those. Even though this is not technically snowboarding, you're still sliding on snow and still part of. Uh, I don't know. I, I I snow skate, and it's like just another way to enjoy yourself. Um, depending on the conditions that you have in front of you, um, and there's some guys who are really good on snow skates, and I think uh, Terry Hawkinson is one of them. I know that <laughs> he's incredible, um, but it's really cool to see. I think because. Uh, if you're into skateboarding, then snow skates make a lot of sense, kind of. It's like totally, you know, totally skateboarding on snow. And there are quite some brands trying different things with it. And there's a big connection also to the to the pulse of uh, movement. I mean, Terry Jensen's grassroots, uh, yeah. they're kind of, as far as I've read it, I'm sure he could tell a lot of other stories. Um, they were kind of for skating and snow in the beginning. And yeah. uh, Wallen yeah. Newbold, uh, he started on when he was with Salomon in the beginnings on his Salomon snow skate, developing mm -hmm. his Esmos out, out of mm -hmm. that beginnings. And right, um, right, yeah, skating on snow is really yeah. full circle again. Yeah, yeah, there's a quite a good uh, group of people in Vermont, uh, Jake Blavel and Bolton Valley. and a lot of the resorts here at Stratton and Jay Peak, they go out, you can go up the lifts with your snow skate. So it's like, why not? Um, so yeah, the other thing we were gonna talk about real quick is uh, the youth, right? And so the future, the future snowboarders, it's, um, you know, like when I was five, snowboarding didn't really exist. Um, but now like my son, he started snowboarding when he was two and now he's 12 and kids are, brought up from a very young age um snowboarding and by the time they're you know if they start at two or three or four or five like there's a gear for them now and you by the time they're 10 they're, it's incredible to see um how talented they are and how stoked they are to be out snowboarding um and so it's turned kind of been now it's like a family thing where before like back in the 90s it wasn't a family thing it was like an underground like core um you know kind of badass movement and now it's like the family sport that's here to stay so totally and also the material um kind of um lilo grevenik who did the graphics for my book 
Um, mm -hmm. he, he runs kind of a project with his family, the snowboarding family. And he started as a kid with his brother and there are also pictures inside and the boards were super large for them. Yeah. Right. And, and nowadays you can get, and they were just small adult snowboards, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. narrowed down and everything. They didn't really work in the beginnings. Mm -hmm. And nowadays you have, uh, perfectly balanced boards for kids, uh, yeah. split boards for kids. Power mm -hmm. surfer for, for kids, it's uh, mm -hmm. full circle again. Totally yeah. awesome. It's even, even on that note, we really didn't touch on it too much, but like, um, you know, women snowboarding products, you know, like back in the beginning, it was such a, you know, male guy sport. Um, and there wasn't really any product even made for women. Um, you know, Shannon Dunn and Cara Beth Burnside are two riders I worked with. Victoria Jalouse, she had a splitboard pro model back in the 90s. Um, and it's nice to see, uh, you know, product designed specifically for women, um, women's splitboards, uh, on and on and on, the outerwear, everything. Um, so it's, it, you know, it's nice that you know, the industry took notice and it was more from the, the riders and the women like, hey, I need boots that actually fit my feet and boards that are smaller and maybe not as stiff torsionally and narrower. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's great to see that like it's our, the, our industry in snowboarding is very well-rounded and, um, you know, supporting all types of riders and all abilities. So it's cool. Totally. I want to look at some questions here. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, well, I have a question for you, Peter. Um, my, this is my question. Um, Tell me. What's, which is your favorite board in your collection? Totally difficult to say. Um, <laughs> I knew that. I yeah, knew I, I, I kind of love them all. Uh, uh huh. I love when they are still in good shape so I can try them. But one of the most special boards is surely the winter stick there. Uh, I, I bought it from Bob Klein and uh -huh. uh, I'm totally blown away from the 3D shape from the, it's super light and it's, it's well, I, I really like the, the winter stick. Um, well, here we are at the bar of the hostel. As we are closed, I could put all the boards here, but all around the the, the, the ceiling there are kind of uh, swallowtail boards. I really, I really love swallowtails. Yeah, yeah. that's <laughs> awesome. Me too. <laughs> so I had a question from somebody like, how um, with all those boards, how do you maintain them? How do you how do you be sure like the edges don't rust or the base is drying out or there was a question from maybe as a collector? Yeah, well, uh, I'm not maintaining them as they should be maintained. Nowadays, when I get new boards, I, I measure them, I try to wax them, have them uh, cleaned and I bring them up. Uh, if I don't have them on display, uh, I have a... Uh, I made it some racks that so the, the camber doesn't go out or so it's mm -hmm. they are like um, vertical mm -hmm. and uh, yeah that's what I'm doing now but uh, I started collecting it kind of 20 years ago so there are still a lot of boards I have to wax and, and restore in a better way I'm working on that but yeah it's kind of my hobby and I don't find too much time but step by step I'm, I'm preserving them better and better. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, I found, uh, as I'm going through my, some of my boards, just boards sitting, brand new boards that's never been on snow, and the bases are completely delammed and falling off the board. So the board actually wasn't made right. Um, and then rust pre prevention, too. It's like it's rusty edges is like, you know, the board's never been, been on snow, and the edges are completely rusted. So waxing them, maybe putting a little bit of anti-rust on your edges is a good way to preserve some of the boards. Um, yeah, I don't have one here, but if you forget about it, uh, then the rust goes under the, the base and it's really yes. ugly. Yeah, you have to pre pre take care. Yeah. Let me just look through some of these questions here. Here's one from uh, somebody. 
Where do you go from here in documenting and preserving the history of snowboarding? Me? Well, um, <laughs> first of all, talking with people and, and getting to know more. And uh, the book was a really cool step, but as it said, it's called A Brief History of the Snowboard, of Snowboarding. Um, in my mind, there would be an, the next step would cover a lot of more boards and bindings. And later on, I would have to go to boots. But, um, mm -hmm. you know, the important thing about snowboarding are, are the people. But as I haven't been there, I don't know them all. So I, I guess for me, I'll just focus on the material and from there on talk to the people all around them because um, I can touch it, I can feel the boards and stuff. And yeah, that's, that's the way I'm trying to go. Here's, here's another question and it was kind of geared towards me, but this isn't really about me. This is really um, about Peter and his book. Um, but um, so, but I wanted to answer it because it's a board that's not in the book. Um, it's JG, what's the most underrated board you worked on and released to the market? And I'm gonna have to say, um, that's the pile driver. Um, Cause that was a board that uh, I worked on. Well, we, we tested it up in BC at Ballface Lodge with Terrier and we had a bunch of different prototypes. And it was a completely different theory where the wide point in the nose was moved back closer to underneath your foot. And it was the only board that I was able to keep up to Terry on chasing him around in deep powder because how fast it was. Um, and I we, we only came in one size. It was a 140, which is pretty short. Um, and the one thing that was really noticeable about that board was you, since the wide point was underneath your foot, this, where the snow was breaking on the board was right at your foot. So no matter how hard you turned, the snow would go by you, would never get face shots. And that's really important when you're on steep terrain, um, so you don't blind yourself, or if when you're in trees, if you get blinded by the snow, and you miss your turn, or you don't want to know when you're coming out, you, it, it's not a good thing. And you know, a lot of times you, it's great to have snow come in your face, but like uh, a lot of times you don't want to do that. You don't want to blind yourself because you, you have to keep focus on what you're doing. So that's, that's my quick answer on, on that. Um, Ooh, totally looking question. forward. I'll have to ask you a question about that one. I think I have from the Austrian prototype manufacturer, I have some, some similar ones here. One day we're going to talk about that. Hi, okay. You, um, yeah, there, what's the board that you've, um, that you, has, has eluded you that you can't find that you're on the hunt for? Oh, there are quite a lot of boards, but I, I do have a list. Well, well, from the history side, there is the, the German, uh, how was it called, snow surf. I'm really, really searching for that one because uh, it was made here uh, kind of two hours away from here. And it was uh, also 3D base shape, also windsurf influenced, and I just can't find it. And then there I have a, a, a big list with kind of, um, now thinking about it just quickly, um, yeah, like the, the really, really, really uh, valuable and, and old boards like the, the original Kidwell round tail or uh, a BB1, an original one, mm -hmm. or uh, I like the lip, lip tags with the ski designs on them. Um, I do have the skis already, the Salomons and the, the ski skis, but I'm still searching for the, for the board suit. <laughs> There's another one for you, Peter. Which board in your collection is your favorite that you still ride at least a few times a year? Hmm. Well, a few times a year for riding. Um, I, 
I really love how the moss from 84 writes in Tao. I did a nice. video project with it and it's incredible. It's kind of fiberglass, it's heavy, it's, it's got a hard boot binding on, but uh -huh. it's so funny, the kind of the, the rocker starts before the back binding and it's so yeah. funny to write it. You, you have to push forward to, to, to still float in power. It's, I'll, I'd say uh, it's not an everyday board, but mm -hmm. a few times a year, that's awesome. It's, it's interesting for myself. Um, sometimes I pull out boards that I remember like, oh, this board is awesome and uh, go back out and ride it. And I'm like, oh my goodness, it, it's not, <laughs> it was awesome then, <laughs> it's not awesome now. Um, <laughs> so th that happens quite a bit actually. I'm like, yeah, let me try this board. And I remember even some, I used to ride ASIM Airs and I went back and rode an ASIM Air. I'm like, ASIM, mm, not me. You know, but back then it was like, this is pretty cool. So times change, right? So um, let's see if I can dig up some other questions here. <laughs> it's, uh, it's pretty interesting how like over time you kind of know what you like. And, um, you know, I was used to riding over a hundred different, uh, different boards a year, well over a hundred different boards a year. And, um, but I don't know if that, you know, kind of like hurt or helped my snowboarding, but that's what I was doing. And, um, and I still try and ride as many boards and I'm always up for like just switching right on the hill. It doesn't matter if it's bindings or stance or anything. Just so I want somebody to ride the board I'm riding. I don't necessarily want to ride the board they're riding, but I want them to feel what, what I'm experiencing. Um, but let me see here. Some of the questions are, uh, here's one. What is the connection between nature and snowboarding uh, the most important to you? Well, um, for me, it's, it's the snow itself. Um, I'm living here up on the mountain and uh, Right now is the, the time when it starts snowing and we get a lot of snow and um, our little, little mini skiing area is all with natural snow. We don't have artificial snow. So uh, I still appreciate that, that the real snow is, is and having a turn, no groomers or anything, just a pal uh, or a tree run and uh, not entering too much into, to, uh building slopes or obstacles and stuff just uh mm -hmm. having the snow covered hills and mountains mm -hmm. Whoa, that's that's for me <laughs> yeah i kind of i felt like i was in winter uh today um up on the mountain it was just kind of like pretty socked in the trees are just covered it feels kind of stormy it's just like a very peaceful setting um when the snows when the snows here um Here's a question, uh, other than the snurfer side of boards, what was your first modern snowboard that you used at a ski hill? Well, um, for me, it was a Burton Air 3. Uh, I kind of cut two skis and screwed them onto a wooden plank and uh, I was riding down our hills and one day they said, yeah, it's really, really dangerous to do that. So uh, we went over to the Kyle factory uh, where Burton started in Europe mm -hmm. and they kind of had an early proto or something. The first kids board they had, the Air Free from uh, the 90 season was the first board I was riding on, on the slope here. Yeah, mm -hmm. with eight years. <laughs> in my first board, I was in New Hampshire uh, working at Loon Mountain. Um, and it's in, interesting, Loon always allowed snowboarding. Where over here in, in Vermont, you, a lot of areas didn't allow it or you had to take a test or you had to can only ride the bottom of the, of the mountain. And Loon was like, bring it on, we don't, we, you know. Um, but I, mine was the, the Elite 150 and it still had uh, metal skegs or, uh, on, the, on, the, on the side and the rails. And I remember the flight guys 
uh, coming up and like, man, take those things off because the board already had steel edges, right? And so why did you need the fins? And then I'm like, no, I can need the fins, man. And and this we're riding at a ski area or a ski resort and um, took the fins off. I'm like, yeah, the, don't need the fins, <laughs> you know? Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's kind of, that was one of the, I think that was one of the first boards uh, pressed at the Kyle factory. Um, so, but it's interesting too, how over time, like, like I don't ride with highbacks anymore and I haven't ridden with highbacks in a long, long time. Um, and you think about like, people ask me, well, there's a little, couple of different reasons why I do that. But, um, you know, you think like the highback was developed because uh, one, the boots weren't very good. The boards were really stiff. They didn't have the right flex. They didn't have the right side cut. And you needed a high back to actually get the, they were long, um, wide. Um, you needed the high back to get the board to turn. And now the boards are so dialed in, the flex patterns, they're light, the, the side cuts, the bend shapes, um, the boots are super dialed. Um, so I, uh, Mike Rankwitz, the one who made me take my high backs off, uh, I was riding with him. And, um, but what it really did for me in my riding was it actually balanced out my toe and heel turn are more equal now, um, they're more balanced. And uh, I was also riding, I, was, I, I ride every day and I was riding so much that I was starting to get a little calf, calf pain from the high back into knee pain, into hip pain, into back pain. And when I took my high backs off, I could, I ride all day long and I had just, all that pain has gone away. So it's an interesting feeling. Um, it's very surfy and, but the, the airs you can do, the little tweaks you can, grabs you can do without the high back digging into your calf is amazing. So I want to, it's like, um, it's, it's, it's something, and I taught my son from day one to ride with no high backs and he's, he doesn't even, he doesn't really know what a high back is because he, I taught him to ride with no high backs. Um, so it's something that you can try, you know, it's easy enough to take your high back off on. I'd recommend on a softer day until you get used to it or a powder day. Um, and now I look around sometimes on powder days and people have their powder setups. Um, a lot of people are riding no high backs, which is, I think is awesome. <laughs> So, let me see if there's another question here. There's a couple of the questions weren't really geared towards. Uh, yeah. Um, here's one. Let me see here. Uh, sorry, you guys. Uh, I keep getting these things popping up. I get blocked out. I don't know. I think we could be good. Do you have anything else to, to uh, say, Peter? I mean, I, I really appreciate everybody joining us tonight and, and the Vermont Ski and Snowboard Museum um, and Abby and all the people that support this museum, the shareholders. Uh, we have a new show coming up. It's going to be launched uh, here pretty soon. Actually, you can, the museum's now open um, Thursday through Sunday. So if you're in Stowe at all, uh, or in Vermont, um, come check it out. And, um, you know, Peter, if you have anything to say, I mean, if you guys can buy a book from Peter, it, believe me, you'll, you might come back and thank both of us. Um, so please do. And uh, anything else, Peter? Yeah, just wanted to say thank you, JG. Uh, I was a little nervous and everything about being here and talking and stuff. And um, I felt so comfortable having you there and guiding me through. Thank you a lot. Abby mm -hmm. and the museum, thank you for that opportunity as well. Please, people, if you can, uh, do a little donation. And yeah, uh, if you can get the book, it's pretty expensive to ship it over to, to the States. But uh, if you want one, just do it. and. Use the code uh, Red Bench Twenty One, so uh, ten percent of of the price will go to the museum. Yes, Thank you, Peter. Thank you. 
Awesome. Well, thank you guys. That was, um, make sure I'm unmuted here. I am, right? Yep. Okay. Uh, super informative and really entertaining. Uh, the three of us have been working on this event for a while, so it's really cool to finally see it come together. Uh, and Peter, your snowboard collection rivals ours. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I want to thank everyone in the audience for joining us tonight. You have by far been the most engaged and active audience we have had since taking these events virtual. <laughs> You've all been interacting with each other in the chat for the entire event, going back and forth, having conversations with each other, uh, clearly uh, very enthusiastic on the topic. And this is why I really love hosting this series, we're able to bring you these interesting topics, but it also brings us all together. And I feel so lucky to be a part of that. Um, so thank you for making this online space so enjoyable for us. And uh, you really, you filled my cup tonight. So thank you. And uh, don't forget to make those donations. I've seen some roll in and some very generous. So thank you. Um, I will do the raffle for a pair of Darn Tough socks tomorrow. So you have all night to make those donations. Um, and like Peter said, you can order the book on his website, snowboardmuseum.com, uh, use code RENTBENCH21, and uh, Peter will generously donate 10% back to us. And uh, I'm not going to make any promises on international shipping, but maybe if you order tonight, maybe it'll be here in time to the end of your tree. We'll see. Um, <laughs> And like JG mentioned, the museum is open for the se uh, season and we do have a new exhibit, The Art of the Graphic. It is really cool. You don't want to miss it. Uh, we also have a gift shop full of stuff for yourself or maybe the skier and snowboarder in your life. Some great gifts in there. Uh, we're open Thursday through Sunday from 12 to 5. Come visit. Uh, we have a really busy and exciting winter ahead of us. So follow us on social media, continue to open our e-newsletters. Uh, that is the best way to stay up to date on everything we have going on. This event was recorded, so it will be available on our YouTube channel next week if you wanna rewatch it, uh, if you had to step away and you missed something, or if you wanna share it with your friends. Um, yeah, and this is the last Red Bench until the new year. So I wanna wish you all a happy holidays. I won't see most of you before then. And again, just thank you so much for tuning in. This has been such a pleasure. pleasure. And uh, have a great evening, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Good night. See you on the mountain. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye.